Hello, my name is Christian Weichel. I'm the Chief Architect and Head of Engineering at Gitpod. And today I would like to talk about Gitpod's architecture, at least from a 20,000 foot view. So Gitpod's mission is to be always ready to code. And so what we provide is on-demand, fully configured, automated dev environments. And in order to provide this, we face a bunch of technical and architectural challenges that we'd like to talk about today. The first one is that by our very nature, we want to offer basically arbitrary code execution on our platform. And as you can imagine, this brings about a bunch of challenges um, that we need to solve. The next is that Gitpod from one code base needs to be able to scale from one user to 5,000 concurrent users. Self-hosted, typically rather small installations to gitpod.io, which is a very, very big installation spread uh, all over the globe. And lastly, we want to run on essentially native Kubernetes. So whenever possible, we try to not break Kubernetes as an abstraction. For example, we do not make particular assumptions uh, towards how the container runtime is configured. So how do we do this? First off, we need to introduce two sort of separate uh, concepts or types of clusters that we run. One which we call meta and the other which we call workspace. And those two are really almost separate applications. They are connected obviously, but they, um, the way they are built and the concerns that they handle are rather separate. Meta takes care of sort of the front end facing side of things. And workspace is, as the name implies, the area where we, or the part where we execute workspaces and operate workspaces in. As you can see here, there's a, a multitude of, of connections between different clusters. So we can have multiple meta clusters um, to keep latency on the front end low, and we can have multiple workspace clusters spread across the globe to also keep latency within the workspace low, but also provide failure domains uh, and react to specialized requirements. So let's talk about Meta first. Meta is the part that you interact with when you visit gitpod.io. This is the thing that serves the dashboard, the thing that you use when you log into Gitpod, when you sign up for a new account, or also when you start a new workspace. How does Meta look like? At the very core, it's a component that we aptly named server. And it is really your traditional web app kind of server. It's written in TypeScript running on Node. And it provides a JSON RPC over WebSocket API that the dashboard then uses to talk to this server. The two are sort of held together using a proxy at the moment, Nginx, but we're looking to make the switch to Caddy. So when a request comes in, the proxy based on a path decides whether that request ought to be served by the dashboard or by the server. The dashboard itself is written uh, also in TypeScript using React and makes heavy use of tailwind.css. And as many of you will know, we've recently gone through a complete rewrite of this component. The server itself talks to the database. Each meta cluster has its own database associated with it. And we have some cross region database mechanism in place to keep them in sync um, across regions. This is very important because the server itself is stateless, which means that we can scale this out horizontally and run many instances uh, of service to react to load within the cluster within meta. Looking at Meta more specifically at the cluster itself, when a request comes in, as said already, it um, hits proxy first, from there goes to either dashboard or server, and server then stores its state in the database. There's also a, let's call it return path on uh, something called Workspace Manager Bridge. And Workspace Manager Bridge's um, concern is to take status updates that come from the workspace clusters and make them available to server and the user. Workspace Manager Bridge itself does not talk directly to server, but rather puts these status updates onto a message bus, in our case, RabbitMQ, 
which then distributes these updates to the individual server instances. Remember, we can have many instances of server. So far, what you've seen is more or less your traditional kind of web application. Server really bundles a lot of concerns. It takes care of the login flow, all the OAuth bits. It talks to the Git hosters like GitHub and GitLab. And it's also the part that prepares um, all the workspace configuration prior to actually starting that workspace. It is also only in Meta that we keep any state that lives beyond a single instance of a workspace. So let's talk about workspaces and their execution. A particular, any workspace cluster on a cluster level has a bunch of services that we need in order to serve service those workspaces. And the very core of it is workspace manager. You can think of this as the equivalent of server, but on the workspace side of things. There's workspace scheduler, which is really a Kubernetes scheduler that we use to get uh, to reach the cloud density that we need. And then there is workspace proxy, which is sort of the proxy equivalent uh, on the workspace side. This is a, a custom Go application um, that acts as a reverse proxy towards uh, workspaces, but also static content. There is some, some static content that needs to be served, and this is done through a component called blob surf, which can serve content directly out of OCI or Docker images. Then on each node, as a daemon set, we operate um, two of our own services. One is called registry facade, and we'll see its purpose in a moment. And then there is workspace daemon. And you can think of workspace daemon as something like the kubelet. It is a process that we use to initialize content within a workspace, to back up content from a workspace, and also to assist in setting up the user namespace that each workspace runs in. Each works workspace itself is a Kubernetes pod. And within this pod, we have sort of three primary processes that we start. The very first one is called workspace kit. And what Workspace Kit does is it sets up a uh, user namespace, PID namespace, mount namespace, etc., to provide more isolation of the workload that runs within the workspace towards the node and towards other workspaces. This is also the piece of tech that enables us to provide Docker or root um, sudo, if you so like, within a workspace. Then there is supervisor. Supervisor's task is to, as the name implies, supervise other processes that run within the workspace. When you look at the process tree within a workspace, you'll see that supervisor is PID1. And this is because Workspace Kit will have created a process namespace, a PID namespace, um, of which supervisor is the root. Supervisor then also starts the IDE, but also acts as, for example, process reaper, and provides an API that other integrations, for example, the IDE, can use to determine if, for example, a port is being serviced from within the workspace. So let's briefly look at how these things go together to start a new workspace. So what happens is when you make the request to, um, to Gitpod, what you'll first hit is the proxy this will probably bring you to the dashboard where you, for example, go on the start workspace page. So if you go on gitpod.io hash context URL, this is the route that you'll take. Dashboard in turn will then make a request to server who will uh, talk to Gitpod, uh, GitHub, excuse me, for example, if the workspace you're trying to start is from a, uh, is hosted on GitHub or GitLab. From there, we will assemble the configuration of that workspace by downloading, for example, the Gitpod YAML that is stored in the repository. This assembled workspace configuration then goes to Workspace Manager. So here we have already selected a cluster in which we are going to start the workspace based on such things as um, availability of the clusters, health, um, but also region that uh, you are operating in. Then 
Workspace Manager will create a Kubernetes pod talking directly to Kubernetes. And Kubernetes then, because we've configured the Workspace Scheduler, will use Scheduler to find a node on which to schedule this pod. Once we have selected a node using Scheduler, Workspace Manager will talk to the Workspace daemon on that node in order to initialize uh, the Workspace content. So basically do a git clone of what it is you're trying to check out. At the same time, Kubernetes will start talking to the kubelet on the node and eventually to the container runtime, for example, container D, uh, to start the actual workspace container. And this is where registry facade comes in. What happens here now is container D will try to pull an image and we've made this image reference such that it talks to a component of our own that is registry facade. And what registry facade does is it basically takes the image that you configured as part of your Gitpod YAML and adds a bunch of layers on top dynamically. So technically what it does is it manipulates the OCI image configuration and manifest to, for example, include the IDE that you'll want to run, VS Code, for example. Eventually the image is pulled and the new container is started and at this point, we've basically gone into Workspace Kit. So this is the entry point of that container. Workspace Kit will then talk to Workspace Daemon um, to, for example, set up the username space, to set up uh, mount namespace, etc. There's a separate talk on, on how we do this available already. And eventually, we'll start Supervisor. Supervisor will then also start the IDE and make sure that it keeps running. All of those operations will trigger status updates predominantly through Kubernetes. Workspace Manager listens for those status updates, translates them into a structure of our own that is a bit more condensed than what Kubernetes offers in terms of information. It's simply more variants, more information in there than what Gitpod needs. So the states that you see as your workspace starts up, they come from, from Workspace Manager at the end of the day. And what Workspace Manager then will do is it will talk to Workspace Manager Bridge. In fact, Workspace Manager Bridge registers on Workspace Manager for those updates. Bridge will take those updates and persist them in the database, but also forward them to Message Bus. And through Message Bus, which is RabbitMQ, we will forward the status updates to server. The dashboard, in turn, listens to those updates through the JSON RPC socket or connection. And this is how you see status updates on the dashboard, but also on the workspace startup screen. So this is the route that, that those um, status updates do take. Now, at some point during the startup, pretty much after the response of Workspace Manager, you will be redirected to your workspace's um, URL. What happens in that moment is that your browser will make a request to Workspace Proxy directly. And that is because the URL of your workspace is such that um, you end up in the specific uh, workspace cluster directly. Now, normally, Workspace Proxy would simply try and route your request to the workspace pod. But there's a very, very good chance that at this point, the workspace pod isn't running yet because we just started it. And this is where BlobSurf comes in. BlobSurf is able to serve some of the requests statically. So depending on the IDE image that you selected, we can serve static components of this, um, of this IDE without the, uh, without the workspace container actually running. And this is how, uh, how workspaces are started. Clearly, I've omitted a lot of details here. For example, how we specifically assemble the workspace configuration. We have also not talked about um, image builds that also play a role. Um, for example, when the uh, when you select a Docker file as part of your image as part of your image configuration, um, this is all orchestrated by server. Um, and this is also how workspace stops happen. So if a workspace uh, wants to be stopped, so for example, if on the dashboard you select uh, stop workspace, what's going to happen is that uh, 
Um, again, the request goes to server. Server will talk to Workspace Manager. Workspace Manager will talk to Kubernetes. And uh, Kubernetes will then terminate the uh, terminate the pod. And eventually the status updates make their way back. And Workspace Daemon um, will create a backup of your content um, before it's lost. So with this high level overview, um, coming back to the challenges I mentioned before, how are we solving them? For one, the arbitrary code execution we solve by creating a lot of isolation within the workspace um, container, within the workspace pod. Uh, no workspace container ever has um, extended capabilities over the uh, on the node. So there's no Capsys admin, for example. And we also employ a form of sort of dynamic resource limiting um, within these containers to keep noisy neighbors in check, for example, uh, by workspace daemon directly manipulating the C groups on the node. So it's specifically um, supervisor or workspace kit that, that help a lot with isolation. The scale we achieve through um, very flexible cluster setups where we can deploy workspace clusters where they are needed and meta clusters where they are needed and connect them to a topology that that serves serves our needs. And lastly, we can run on Kubernetes because we found what I would consider creative solutions and workarounds to um, to make it put work and to pull in sort of the orthogonal image concerns that we have, for example, IDE on top of the workspace image without having to resort to things like a custom snapshotter. So with this, I would like to end. This was sort of a very brief, high-level overview of Gitpod's architecture. If you would like to know more, please um, ping me, send us a message, get in touch. Message, get in touch.